So welcome. Um, UNCG Libraries has done a series of online learning and innovation webinars for a couple of years now due to um, us all being from home and courses shifting to online quickly. Uh, we did this series. We've been doing a series of panels with online learning experts at UNCG on a variety of topics. So our first one was on best practices of virtual meetings. Our second one had faculty who were experienced in online uh, classes. So uh, they talked about their experiences with online learning uh, and their expertise. And today we're talking about academic integrity, online courses, and Respondus Lockdown Browser. Uh, so you're welcome to put your questions in this Google form and that's where we'll start since we have some questions in there. Um, this is an informal panel. Our panelists today are April Black from an ITC from the Bryan School and Anita Warford, the ITC for the College of Arts and Science, both from UNCG. We have other ITCs in the room, uh, so they are welcome to share their expertise if they have anything to add as well. And again, you're muted upon entry. Uh, if you wanted to unmute to ask a question, that's fine. But as April and Anita are explaining something, uh, you can leave yourself muted. So um, to go to the form first, let me pull it up. Um, so the first question is a, is a loaded one. So um, I, we can start there. Um, and uh, if you wanted to give a quick introduction to Respondus, that's fine too, April and Anita. Um, but uh, how do we balance the students without resources, such as webcams and bad internet, with those who are abusing the system? And that is the first question. And again, you're welcome to put other questions in the chat. Um, I'll put the form in here as well. Again, if you would rather use that. And uh, I'm going to mute myself. Thanks. So I'll start with that one, April, if, if that's OK. Sure. Um, I have worked um, with exactly one person who has used uh, Lockdown Browser and Monitor. And uh, it relates to this question because they started using it right when we went into the quarantine situation. and. Um, you know, what I told that person is um, on a normal basis, if you are um, doing a fully online course, the course is listed that way. There is an expectation for the students to have the technology that they need to do that. So, you know, students who take fully online courses are expected to have um, reliable, consistent access to a computer, internet, et cetera. Um, during this quarantine, situation though it is a little different um you know the provost was very clear in saying that we're moving to remote learning and not really online learning and um you know we could not assume that all students have uh regular or even any access to a computer on their own and so you have to keep that in mind so you know, I had an instructor who uh, he had never really done online before because of these very issues. He was concerned about academic integrity. And so to move his tests online, he wanted to use um, monitor, like AM browser and monitor. So we set that up, but I told him, um, you know, the disadvantage that you're at with this is that um, if a student comes back to you and says, um, you know, the technology didn't work or, you know, I don't have bandwidth or just whatever, um, you know, you really, you have to address that. You can't just tell them, you know, too bad because they did not sign up for a course that was meant to be delivered that way. So he still did move forward. And fortunately he only had, um, I think one or two very small issues, but you know, the situation with a quarantine, I think is a little different because um, students are in a remote environment that they did not sign up for or plan for. So um, generally speaking, if you're doing this in a fully online course, that is an expectation of the course. Now, if, um, if you're trying to do, um, you know, lockdown browser monitor in a course that is, you know, normally on campus, then, you know, you could consider, for example, um, a computer lab scenario, if you're worried about your students having access themselves. Um, so April, do you have anything more to add to that? Yeah, I'm gonna um, just use my space bar to unmute myself for the moment. Um, I'm trying to keep mute and unmute going back and forth, but um, I had a, a student um, in a face-to-face -face class that had moved to online who lives up in the mountains and they have very limited bandwidth up in the mountains. So they were having some issues with lockdown browser and monitor. So 
what the instructor decided to do um, in this scenario is to um, allow the student to take the exam um, outside of Respondus Lockdown Browser. But that was with um, several testings of their bandwidth and we went through quite, quite a few steps to try to um, help the student get on. And the bottom line was um, the student ended up sending an email request to increase the bandwidth, but because of location in the middle of nowhere up in the mountains, there was no access to increased bandwidth. So in, in that scenario, and because this is, was a face-to-face -face class that was going to um, online instruction mandated, so quote, remote learning, we had to make an exception. And in COVID-19 world, we are making lots of exceptions. And that's what the provost has said we are going to do. So flexibility is key to success. It doesn't mean it's a bad tool. It just means that the tool was not designed for use where students have little, if any, internet access. And those kinds of students probably aren't going to select online learning as their choice of education. And Erin, did you say you wanted to add something to the question? That's fine. You can unmute. Yeah, thanks. That, it was actually my question. So that's, I just wanted to follow up on it. So I appreciate uh, the, the feedback on this, I guess. And I know this is a unique situation being the transition, et cetera. And this may not be the appropriate conversation for this forum, but the provost and everyone seems to always be making all these concessions for students and saying, oh, wow, uh, remote access. My, my real question is, we have some students, I get they're in the mountains, they may have bad access, but I know that some students are literally living a block from campus. I know they have fine internet, but they are saying, I'm having tech issues. And we are being told as faculty, you have to be an exception, you have to be flexible, you have to be flexible. At what point is the tipping point where, look, we can't be any more flexible, we keep making, we're, uh, there's, we're gonna be extending this academic relief into the summer now, which completely, uh, I agree with Anita, students now know what they're getting in the summer, but they're still gonna have this academic relief patches extending in there, and we're gonna get the same thing. Students coming back and saying, I don't have good internet. Well, you should have known that before you signed up for a course. So I just, I know it's a really bad question. It's a loaded question, but you know, we spend 90% of our time doing with 10% of the students, and, and how do I deal with those 10% of the students who I know have good internet, I know that their, their webcam works, and here they are saying, I can't take this exam online, or their camera goes off to the corner and said, oh, that was just a slip. How do you so Aaron, I'm gonna address that because we did have a student, and here's an example in, 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 in a specific course, um, with Lockdown Browser, during the testing of his camera, his camera worked perfectly well. Um, everything went completely fine in his preview, his environmental check, um, it, it was a smooth start and uh, less than two minutes into the exam, the camera quote start, stopped working. And so he took his exam without the camera on and so all of these notifications came up. Well, when we review the, the footage, the student literally took a sticky note and stuck it on his camera and covered his camera. And then he lifted it up, he looked, and then he covered his camera again because the light was still on. And he tried to say it was a technology issue. Well, that's an academic integrity issue. So the instructor took it forward as academic integrity. There's a difference in um, a true technology issue and an academic integrity violation. His, that example was an academic integrity violation. I also believe that when a student says that they are, uh, they have no, they're having technology issues and they're not having real technology issues, whether it be bandwidth, which they're saying they don't have bandwidth, and they haven't had bandwidth issues throughout however many weeks you've been in the class. It just happens when they're taking a test. Um, most of the time, I will, I will suggest to the instructor they pull them in for a conversation, and usually it just takes one one-on-one -on -one conversation with a student for them to change their tunes. Um, I think most students, and I know you said only 10%, but I would say 10% is probably high, um, especially if you're in a large class size um, for students who are going to um, fake it and try to get away with not having to use the camera because they do want to cheat. Um, I, I, but, you know, it, it is a rock and a hard place because the students that I'm referencing are students who didn't choose to be in an online class 
and they were forced into it because of COVID-19. So I do think we have to be a bit flexible, but if, as you say, they're a block from campus, then that's academic integrity versus technology, and then you have to address it one-on-one -on -one with the student. I'll jump in, Sam, and because um, I see that there's a question about, um, you know, exactly what respondents do. Um, so I'll just explain that briefly, which I think will also sort of clarify some of these issues about how to deal with students who claim problems. So there are two uh, parts to respond us when we're talking about that. There's lockdown browser and then there's monitor. And uh, ideally they work together. Uh, it's enabled in all of your Canvas courses so anyone can use it. And uh, so what they do, so lockdown browser by itself, and you can use lockdown browser alone, is it um, you go into your Canvas course and you put these settings on your quiz or quizzes and it in, in brief, what Lockdown Browser does is just what it sounds like. It locks your browser down so students cannot open new tabs or applications or whatever while they're taking the test. Uh, so you can do that by itself or you can do uh, Monitor as well, Lockdown Browser with Monitor. And what Monitor will do, so you'll have all the functionality of Lockdown Browser and, and locking down the browser, but then Monitor also on top of that records a video of the student taking the test and you set all of the different parameters to use. Um, so you can have things like um, uh, students can do, so first of all it does walk through students through um, a technology check before they start the exam. Then um, you can have them do things like show their ID to the camera for an ID check. Uh, you can have them, if, and this is an important thing about too, because if they're on a laptop or if they have an eyeball camera, this is going to work. But if they have, you know, a camera on a monitor, it's going to be a problem. But you can have them do an environment check, which is where they pick up their camera and they do a circle of their room. So you can see what's in there with them. Uh, so you can do different things like that. Um, and then, um, based on what you select, you know, it's going to record the student taking the video and then at the end it will, um, the instructor can review these videos and it will give flags to where it, you know, something happened that might be suspicious. For example, if um, the camera detects two faces on the screen or, or no faces, if the person goes off the screen for a second, it will um, give a red flag for that. But uh, the key thing to know with Monitor is that it it really, it's not going to truly detect cheating for you. It's, um, it's going to record a video of the student taking the test and flag possible alerts for you, but it's still a manual process in that the instructor has to go in and review that video and look at those flags and see what you can determine from those flags if you think that, you know, cheating did occur or was it someone's, you know, small child just running behind them or something like that. So there's still a lot of um, human judgment involved with it. So that's basically what it does. Um, it, um, it does not play well with a lot of publisher content. Um, the respondents people tell you, um, you, can, you can put um, domain exceptions in your settings so that if you want students to be able to go to a website as part of their test, you can, you can put that in there. Uh, but they do tell you up front, it's not meant to work with these publisher systems, so you'll be using that at your own risk. So uh, it's primarily meant for people to use, you know, for their own content inside of Canvas, not um, not necessarily for people who are using something like Pearson or Macmillan and their, you know, fully functioning publisher content online. Does that, does that answer that question? Well, yeah, I was just asking because uh, it seems like two different approaches uh for example you get the randomization in the package stuff you uh you get you know an order and they as some of them can actually with numerical problems they can scramble you know they can uh, have student specific numbers in a way and so that provides a lot of a lot of security so it sounds to me not having ever used responders for thinking about it the main thing you're worried concerned about it sounds to me like is either people using the internet as a source during their test or um, uh, uh, perhaps uh, notes or something and you don't want them to use notes and you're supposed mm -hmm. to look at that and, and detect that somehow. Uh, I guess for me, going into this whole area of testing online, I've done online courses through a Pearson kind of module, but 
me creating tests, the thing uh, for this semester, what I just started doing is saying it's open note, it's open book. I have to change the test <laughs> to make it harder. Uh, you know, I mean, that's one of the responses there. Uh, and, and it just, um, yeah, so I was just basically wondering, is it worth the investment of responders and is it effective enough? And especially in a class of 90 or 100 students, is this, it, does it work well in that environment? You know, so what it, okay. well, I was just gonna say real quick, what, it, what I think that it really works well for is um, a deterrent. If students know that they're being recorded, uh, they, they are, you can't guarantee, but they're certainly a little bit less likely to cheat if they know that the camera's on them. But uh, it really depends on how, you know, how you teach your course. I do a lot of academic integrity presentations that are on, um, you know, what you can do to discourage cheating in your course outside of this kind of sort of proctoring environment. And that works well for a lot of people. But, you know, there are some um, disciplines where Mm -hmm. They have to, you know, be more concerned than others and, and, and some disciplines where, um, you know, cheating is just so rampant. In the college, we deal with that with the languages a lot. And so this does give an option um, for those people. And the only other thing I'll say, and then I'll let April take over, is just, um, you know, one thing that I think that monitor will potentially be good for I mean, now and especially in, in the future is, you um, Technically, we're supposed to be confirming the identities of our students, um, whether online, face-to-face, -face, you know, across the board. And we, outside of Monitor, we don't really have, you know, a good method in place for that. And so Monitor does give us the option. So even if you're not actually going to be reviewing the videos, um, you know, if, if we get to a point, which is very likely where we do have to really sort of officially show that we are checking identities it does give you that option you can run monitor and have them put their id right up to the camera so you can confirm identity you know i don't know if that's the you know the easiest way you basically have a lot of video that you wouldn't necessarily have to look like look at unless an issue came up but so it is it is good to have for that mm -hmm. but um and, and can i just ask just quickly on that does uh, our online uh the uh, learning people who help develop online courses, do they generally use Respondus in, in, in their framework or not? Is well, Respondus is, we, we've had Respondus Monitor on campus for, for years and then it, it went kind of went away in popularity. But as we've been taking more and more courses online, depending on the need for um, exam security, the need for Respondus Lockdown Browser slash Monitor has definitely increased. Now, for two reasons, the Bryan School went with this last semester. Um, and I'm only speaking for the Bryan School and not for the whole campus. But the first reason was we had several faculty members who were very concerned that in some of their large online courses that students were having other students take their exams. So by using this, the photo ID, holding it up, it has the student's name on it, the student face, and so you have a way of confirming that yes, your student is the one who takes the course. The second reason is cost. Um, for students to have a, take a proctored exam, it's very expensive. Using Respondus Lockdown Browser currently for the students, and this may change in a year or two as we move down the road, but for the, at least the next year, there's no cost for our students to take their exams through Lockdown Browser. If they were paying per exam, it would generally run about 30 bucks an exam. So you can imagine that across the course of a semester for a student who's enrolled in two or more courses, you're looking at a, a sizable chunk of change for them to have, say, six proctored exams across a semester you know, in multiple classes. So it gets quite expensive for the students. And once they hear that they have an option of either taking their exam in Lockdown Browser Monitor, or they can go to a proctored site and pay a proctor close to 30 bucks to take the exam in, in a proctored site, there's usually very little argument about, about having their camera on. That totally changes the conversation once they realize, oh, this is a money saving for me they get less picky about having to take it online. Um, I can show you an example of the videos if, if you'd like. I can show you Lockdown Browser um, in a real class. And um, 
And then Sandra had a follow up, I think. Okay. Yeah. So I have a class with with 99 students in it and I used that for the last exam and um, there was only about six students that had high risk flags. So obviously, you know, I didn't have to look through a lot. Um, one, there was an, there was out of 99 students, there was one academic integrity. And the challenge with it though is um, it was clear what the student was doing is that they would do something and then they look consistently were looking down to their left. Well, the problem is they did not do the proper environmental scan. Now, according to the Dean of Students, that's inappropriate behavior because you didn't follow directions. But I guess, so there's, there's my question here is how do you ensure students, um, because I couldn't confirm that person was cheating they admitted to it because the evidence was pretty clear. It was pretty obvious. But how do you confirm that if they don't do the right environmental scan? And you don't know that until after it's over. Do you just threat them with academic integrity if they don't do it? Or, you know, that's... I'm we sure have two I went, practices. Yeah, I went, I'm sure if I went through those other 100 videos, there'd probably be at least 10 other people that didn't do that right. So, you know, it, here's, the, here's what we do, I, I, and, and I recommend this for anybody who's going to use Respondus. The first time that you do a, a, an actual test in Respondus should be a low stakes, maybe even just for fun, giggles and grins, five extra credit points that are going to be added to your exam score, whatever you, however you want to do it. But it's really low stakes for students and have them go through and, re, you know, take a practice quiz in Respondus Lockdown Browser where they have to run through all the security tests and all of that stuff. It's low time. It doesn't take you a lot of time, but they I have do. all those directions and they know if, if when they sign the academic integrity pledge, you can write it in your, I include a question in our quizzes and I encourage our faculty to, to do the same. The first question is worth zero points. It's an acknowledgement of the academic integrity quiz. I mean, policy, and then in that statement, it includes, I know that I am to do an environmental check, show my ID, and stay on my camera the entire time I'm taking this test. And then right. when you click yes to that, okay. then you kind of have them. So I'll, I'll keep that in mind for future. The problem though is um, they were able to go through those steps successfully without doing the proper scan. They did a scan, but it's one thing to show the back of your office or your room. Yeah. It's another thing to show your workspace. And that's what right. they didn't do. And so they did all the steps and it didn't, it didn't talk back to them that you didn't do it right. So, and I did a practice quiz so they would know um, how to make, so they couldn't come to me and say, I didn't know how it worked because I gave the opportunity to figure that all out. So I thought I, you know, covered yeah. my bases, but, um, and then my other question is there was, at the end of the exam, there were six or eight people that it did not capture a video on. Hmm. Um, it said, you know, and it was from Respondus that there was some kind of um, technical error. And I'm wondering what that is, or if that's a situation where they turned off the camera. I don't know. I haven't seen that. I, I, I don't know. I would follow up with respondents maybe or maybe with your ITC and your department, have them take a look at your error code and uh, the video footage. I haven't seen that happen before. Um, the only time, only thing problem we had at one point was this instructor made a very small window for taking the exam. In fact, she did it during her, she had 150 students and they all needed to take the exam. Well, actually it was closer to 300 because she did two sections at the same time and they had a two hour window from eight to 10 in the morning and they all started it at eight o'clock. So it was a log jam. So um, I don't know if it was through our Canvas portal or if it was through Respondus, but we had a few students who panicked because they weren't able to do the camera check. And so they can't start the exam until they do that camera check, but all they had to do was exit out and start again and they eventually were able to do it. But it took some students five or 10 minutes to get in, which created a lot of stress for the instructor because she was getting tons of student email about it. But she learned okay, I she's got, gonna have a broader window. Okay, I got that. My concern with that is how do you keep students from talking to each other if you don't do it synchronous? Uh, about, about exam content. That's why I did it synchronous. 
and I did and I did experience that a little bit where people were getting kicked off or getting freeze frames but um, I you know in, a, in the final exam we're being encouraged to do it during the final exam block um, and, so and that's how how it should be done what I'm saying is she did two sections all at the same time and it, one section was eight to nine and one was nine to ten and so instead of doing her eight to nine from eight to nine and her nine to 10 from nine to 10, she did them all in that one block. Okay, so 100 students is not a problem then. Yeah, 100 students won't be a problem. And 300 shouldn't be a problem, but it was at the beginning of the COVID-19, so probably the first week we were actually, everybody in the country was going online. So I think that there've been some kinks in the system that have now, that have now been worked out because the second round of exams that I've had go through have been much smoother than that first week um, after we went to, after COVID. So I, I think that there there was such a thing as a log jam. There shouldn't be that should not exist anymore. I can't say it won't happen again, but my hope is that it won't happen again. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And to add to that real quick. Um, a lot of people initially start to look at um, respondus monitor because they do want something that's really going to be like a person physically sitting in the room and watching what they do and the reality is that you know with technology it's it's just not there yet you know a lot of people when they try this and they see um, how much um, not just manual work but also individual judgment is involved they tend to you know, unless they really have to they tend to step back from it because you don't get that sort of a guaranteed answer you know Unfortunately, the reality um, is that students who are really committed to cheating are going to find a way. You know, you could do the game uh, the system. Yeah. They do. You know, you can do your environmental check and do it very thoroughly, and you can see everything. And then, as soon as the student actually then starts to take the quiz, they can um, reach under and pull off notes that were taped under the desk. And if you're careful, you may be suspicious, but you won't, you know, see that happen. So. Uh, I think that the biggest thing is um, is to is to know going in. You know, there there is no absolute guarantee, but also um, what you can do. I think an important thing is to um, think about different things that could happen, different um, excuses, real or not, that the students could have, and just upfront kind of know what your plan is going to be. Um, for example. Um, you know, if you see someone that's, you know, looking like this a lot, but you don't actually see the notes, you can't say definitively the student is cheating, but one thing you could do to check is to get them kind of on the spot in Zoom or on the phone or whatever, where they cannot quickly access their material and ask them the same questions. What did you say for this question? Um, I've had to do that before outside of respond. It's just for someone who took, you know, a test in Canvas and you know, their answers didn't match up and they couldn't answer the questions, um, but that's still extra work for you. Um, well, the one, beauty, a, the one beauty of it is it sent up 40 red flags because of lack of facial recognition because she was turning away from, so there was lots of evidence to support even though I couldn't see, mm -hmm. um, but in the lack of the environmental scan, but, but that, that's kind of tenuous because I couldn't prove it because but she couldn't prove it either because she hadn't done the right environmental scan. So that's where, you know, with really onus was on the student because the instructions were there. Yeah, you know, and usually students will end up when you call them one on one and you have your evidence and you share them, even if it's one on one in a zoom session, they usually end up confessing that they did do it and they apologize. Now, the student who actually did the post it note never acknowledged that he put a post it note there. He just continuously said um it was uh his camera didn't work his camera didn't work his camera didn't work but he did say he was sorry but he never said the words i put a post-it note there although it was quite evident he i mean it was a square yellow post-it note but he would never say those words um but he acknowledged that he um didn't do it correctly and he took his zero and said he wouldn't it wouldn't happen again so. i do think you need to have a clear policy for what you're going to do if a student, um, for example, uh, we had a student who did the ID check, but um, I don't even know how it let this go by because it's supposed to focus on the ID, but it's like her holding her ID about right here. And you, you, I mean, there's no way you could see on that. Um, or, you know, someone doing the environmental check, but not doing it correctly. 
those are the kinds of things I think you need to go ahead and decide what your policy is going to be and hold firm to it because those are things that's not going to be a technical issue you know if the camera is working you can do a correct environmental check you can get your id close enough so that you can confirm identity and i think if you're going to do if you're going to use monitor then on those kinds of things you need you need to be very firm you know you do this or it's a zero because otherwise they will try to scam the system and like i said those are things that that's not you know as long as you're clear on what you want from that those are not things that are going to be technical difficulties and if you give them you know another chance then then in essence they have seen the quiz and so the whole point in using it kind of goes out the window because these people are going to get an, an advantage over the other students so i do think on those things just have a hard policy and say you know you're going to get a zero if you don't do these things correctly and and the bottom line is uh, anita's already said this students the students who really want to cheat are going to try to cheat um, it's the same in a face-to-face -face classroom when you, when you gave a test in your classroom, even if you walked around the room, there are students that have, if they have a will, a strong enough will and spend enough time planning their attack for cheating, are going to be able to cheat and sometimes successfully. Sometimes they get caught and sometimes they don't, but using a system like Respondus or some other form of proctoring does help you ensure you that you've done the most you can possibly do for exam security number one and academic integrity number two so that's and i think i think that, that answers a lot of the questions on the form because a couple people asked about like there's youtube videos that try like help students get around it but someone did ask and um randall if you want to um ask a question too after i throw this one out there that was on the form is respond as accessible so that is a um kind of a, a tentative yes so um you know they say that respond Bondus is is accessible and that it, um, it is screen reader compliant. Um, what you need to know, though, is that um, Respondus is not going to make anything else automatically compliant. So if you have, you know, quiz questions that have images without alt tags or whatever, Respondus is not going to automatically fix that for you. So, uh, you know, um, and I mean, in full disclosure, I have not I have not tested this, but uh, you know, according to the respondents, people, um, their their framework is accessible, but it's still on you to make sure that whatever you're putting inside of it is accessible as well. And that that goes back to well, I'm going to use Pearson because that's something that we have quite a bit of experience with for uh, uh, blind students. Um, Pearson is doing better and trying to get their exams more compliant, but. Uh, often you have publishers who have exam content that is not screen reader friendly. For instance, the choice responses sometimes aren't even available for clicking on with JAWS. So, you know, this is not the fix all for compliance. The content in the respondents um, website and on their help documentation says that Respondus Lockdown Browser Monitor is compliant in and of itself. But again, as Anita pointed out, it only is as good as what you put into it. So if you are trying to put in a non-compliant test question that has uh, an image without alt text or a video without captioning that your students have to watch and make provide feedback for, it doesn't fix those pre-existing questions. So I just that's very redundant, sorry. <laughs> and Randall, what's your question before I go back to the form? Okay, so it'll end up it'll be some observations and then a very specific question. So just the observation, first of all, I'm in the accounting department in the Bryan School. I have faculty who take academic integrity very seriously. In fact, our online classes have uh, always required students either to use a proctor or they allow them to take to it at campus. Uh, in the current environment, obviously, like for the summer classes, that's not going to be feasible. And I'm going to actually encourage my student, my professors to use Respondus. I think going, going forward, and I was teaching an online class, I would use Respondus. But because this was a unique situation, I was very cautious going in. And so 
I didn't require it for my first two exams that I gave online like Ken. I gave them open book, open note. Uh, and the results were pretty satisfactory. The mean was not significantly different than what I had without um, you, you know, an exam in person where it was closed book. But now I'm looking at the final and confronted sort of a different situation that historically I've given the students the entire three hours for the final. Um, because I figured the university gives them a three hour block, I should allow them to use that three hour block and particularly some of the people for whom English is a second language, they desire that. But now sort of the open book, open note, when you, you know, my exam is not intended to be that long, that gives them a lot more time to fish around for things. And so what I had been debating is the option was to go with, you know, Respondents Lockdown Browser or to say, you're not gonna have three hours for the exam. You're gonna have an hour and 45 minutes or, or two hours. So the very specific question is, can I have some students on Respondents Lockdown Browser and others who are not? Only if you create two exams. Oh, that's way too much work. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't mean two different exams. I mean two exams for your students. So yeah. to have a list of students that you are taking in Lockdown Browser and create an exam for those students in Lockdown Browser, and then a list of students who are taking it without Lockdown Browser and put the same exam but create a separate exam instance um, for those specific students. Why would you want to do that? So I'm, I'm debating the relative merits of it that I have students that now have taken two online exams with me, open book, open note. Uh, I was totally comfortable with that in a 75 minute block. Like I said, the results were satisfactory. But now um, if I give them a three hour block, that gives them um, the opportunity, more opportunity to look for things online that might allow them to answer the questions. Uh, if I shorten the length of time for the exam, they might complain that I didn't give them the entire period allocated by the university. So that to me is the trade-off. So uh, here's, here's an option you could think about, and I, I'm just posing a potential option. You could do a poll with your students and ask them if they would like to have a three hour exam with more questions or if they would prefer a shorter exam time, but still open book um, as their prior two exams have been. Yeah, in fact, I, I was going to do that poll yesterday and then I got the invite to this and it's like, mm, let me get a little more information before I pull my <laughs> students on that. Okay. And that kind of leads into there's a couple of questions on the form um, and then Kenneth ask your question too, but there's a couple of questions on the forum about what student, what information students get about Respondus, about the privacy policies, and whether there's an opt-in or opt-out feature for students. Uh, and uh, Ken, you can ask a question too. Well, I was just going to respond to Randy just to tell him, I'm, I'm restricting the time from three to two hours. I've done that face-to-face -face before too. And so I just let students know way ahead of time that's what it's going to be. And I've never had a complaint. But of course, I'm a, a really nice guy. <laughs> Sorry, and, you yeah. laugh so loudly. <laughs> okay. You are a very nice guy. I'm just teasing. Yes, yes, yes. Um, Randy, I think pedagogically, just this is just my little soapbox, I think it makes way more sense for you to give them the same kind of test that, they, that you've given them the, the other two tests. So if I were you, I wouldn't change it. I would keep it in the same time framework that they're used to and keep it open book. And I wouldn't go to Respondus because you haven't used Respondus earlier in the semester. And it's a high stakes quote exam environment. Even if it's not weighted more, they feel like it is because it is the term exam. So I, I think it's a risky time to, to, to move over to using Respondus for the very last test. I would just keep the timing the same and keep it as, as you've already done the other two tests. Well, when you said timing the same, I think I'll probably take Ken's advice and shorten the length. And if, if somebody really, really says they want three hours, well, then I'll tell them, hey, I'll create an exam for you and you'll have to use the lockdown browser. Yeah. You know, if I could jump in here, there is one thing that comes to mind where, where that scenario actually might be a good option is um, 
when we first adopted Monitor, there was a discussion, but it's so new on campus that we don't have any, really any formal campus-wide policies. But um, it, it, there's a concern that some students, you know, we have students already who will go, you know, for example, to ORS and request specific accommodations for different things. And so, um, in, in a, you know, a majority of those on our campus, it, you know, relates to, you know, anxiety type issues, text taking anxiety. And so it has come up several times, you know, what if students start to claim that they want an exemption from, you know, having to do monitor because of anxiety issues. And I mean, I can sort of relate to that in a way because I've always been a good student, but the thought of, of knowing that that camera is watching everything I do, I think that that would, you know, sort of throw me off and I would be, you know, more concerned about what I'm doing you know, myself and how I'm taking the test. So I think there, there is some validity to that issue. Um, and so, you know, in a face-to-face a -face scenario, um, an option is that you can give them a choice between you can do monitor or you can come to class and take it, you know, on computer, paper, and pen, and I'll be right there watching you that way. Um, you, so you could give them that option. But, you know, again, right now for the summer, that's not an option. So if you have a case, you know, where a student has a real issue with the thought of being recorded like that, then that is, you know, way to deal with it. In Canvas, you can, you don't have to make the same test twice. You can duplicate the exam and put one in um, monitor with more time and then one outside um, that has a much tighter window and then students could choose. Um, if you only assign you know, to the students who pick one or the other, then you're not having to do any extra gradebook work. So, um, so it is a way, that is a good way that you could address that issue if you ever get where students are saying that they have, you know, a real, you know, phobia or whatever about anxiety about, you know, knowing this camera is watching them. It gives them some choice, so that could be useful. Yeah, I, I will say I had more than one student who struggled with that the first time of being watched, you know, this whole idea um, and anxiety. So, and they worked through it, all of them. Um, and there was one I agreed to do on Zoom. <laughs> How that was different, I don't know, but she ended up ended up doing it on monitor. But it it created a lot of test anxiety, just the idea of somebody watching. So, but again, it, it's part of that learning curve of people getting used to a new normal. So y'all are welcome to put your questions in the chat. Um, I want to be cautious of time, and I am moderating another um, webinar. Um, some of the last questions in the form are um, we talked about student like students a lot of questions about what students uh, should know privacy stuff but then also um, are there any devices or browsers respondents doesn't work well in that faculty should advise students about and the last one um, just to put it out there in case people want to drop things in the chat again I know Michelle and Carla are here Michelle is the ITC for HHS right now uh, with Pam who I think is still out on leave, right? So definitely email Michelle. And then Carla is one of the ITCs for the School of Education. So if you're in any of those schools, definitely contact them. Uh, but also there was a question about, is there any um, documentation or a kind of quick how-to out there for faculty? So those are the last two questions as we kind of wrap up. I'm gonna just start real quickly. Um, there were a lot of questions involved in that question. So let me start with, Yes, there are some tech tools that don't work with Respondus. Uh, Chromebook does not work with Respondus. Um, and we've had issues with Chromebook for lots of things. Um, so if a student has Chromebook or if they're using a mobile device, if it's not an Apple mobile device, it will not work. If it's not an iPhone, it will not work. Um, so first of all, let me say that we always tell our students, don't take an exam on your phone, but if they are, it needs to be an iPhone or it's not, it's, it's, there's a good chance that the, the camera's not going to actually work with the exam software. So, um, Apple just happens to have, um, the Respondus app that you can install. And if they're going to do it on, uh, an Apple iPhone or an iPad, there's a check, there's a, in the settings button in Respondus lockdown browser that, faculty member has to allow that. So there's a place in settings that you have to check if you're going to allow your students to take it on an iPhone or an iPad. But any other um, mobile device like Chromebook or um, Android phones, um, no, it does not work. The second part of that question, Anita, you want to grab? I'm sure. Just to add to that too, um, they, uh, 
Respondus does not, um, they say they don't officially support any phone. So um, you would have better luck with an Apple device than an Android for sure. But uh, definitely students shouldn't be taking tests on phones anyway, especially not in this. But um, uh, officially it's, um, it's only iPads and April's right. You have to check that little box. Um, as far as the other part of the question was related to documentation, right? How to's and mm -hmm. such like that. So I have a link to a document I created that I'll share in the chat. Um, in addition, when you first um, go in to uh, respond us, so once you've set up your quizzes and then you go to the respond us, you know, lock down browser button to start applying these settings. When you first click on the button, if you go into Canvas, you'll see it brings up a little, um, box that links to all sorts of how to's quick videos documentation all of that and I was just in there today actually and they now have a um so I clicked into a quiz that I had already applied the settings on just so I could see these settings in front of me for this and they have a little bar at the top now that says are you new to respond to monitor proctoring see the rapid rollout guide here so they do have how to's once you just sort of click on the lockdown browser button in your left hand menu they have a lot of, of short videos and documentation listed there but I'll put the link in um, for my document as well to get you started and what was your question yeah, my question is just, um, we haven't talked much about using only lockdown browser. We spent a lot of time on the monitor part, you know, but, but do people just use lockdown browser if their main concern is uh, restricting their, their access to other internet sources? Um, is that a popular configuration? Uh, I'm not sure if it's a popular configuration and we don't have, we haven't used it long enough at UNCG to, um, to really answer that question. I don't, I don't know if it's a popular configuration, but it's certainly doable. Um, and the reason you would do that is because you would just be concerned that your students not access websites. So what Lockdown Browser does is it keeps them only in the Canvas quiz and you do have a choice when you're in your settings about can they, if they have a technical issue, can they actually leave lockdown browser? Now, it, obviously you'll get a notification if they do, and you can check that as yes, and you might wanna check that as yes, because every now and then there might be an issue where a student has a technical problem, maybe right. the power goes out, maybe they lose their internet connection, things can happen. And if you haven't checked, allow them to leave, leave lockdown browser, then they're stuck in lockdown browser because they haven't ever submitted their exam. So. Yeah, well, I was just asking because in my classes, I do a lot of online quizzes in the meantime. And so when they gave them their exam, I had to make sure I disabled all those quizzes. Right. Or, you know, uh, otherwise they could just, you know, use them uh, at the same time. So it would be useful to, to restrict them from your own content. Right, right. On your own course. Right. Uh, that's, that's something else. Uh, so Lockdown Browser is very, I mean, it works ex perfectly for that. Okay, great. Thanks. And Susie has um, one last question. Yeah, first of all, I just wanted to say how enormously helpful this has been. I really appreciate, hey, April, hey, Anita. Um, this has just helped me a lot as I haven't used it much and you've given us some um, tips and tricks I wouldn't have thought of. Uh, my, my question is a little specific, but uh, I'm working with some faculty who want to include file upload questions in their Canvas quiz. For example, they're having students draw something on pencil and paper, like a diagram, and then take a, picture of it with their phone to then upload while they're taking their exam on their computer. Is that the kind of thing respondents will allow or will they, will that be flagged probably? It will be flagged. That whole activity will be flagged that taking the phone because any, anything like that would be send a huge flag up. Number one, they could be taking a picture of the screen, copying your test questions. There's so many reasons that that's a warning sign for um, respondents lockdown browser. But if it's a file upload question, what I've been telling people is to make your test a two-part test. Part two is your file upload, part two question. Or if you want even students to do problem solving where they're writing the problems out, I would have that part of the part two part of the test because you want to see their actual work. Um, so I would use Respondents Lockdown Browser Monitor for multiple choice, true, false, short answer, and essay question. That's what I would use Respondents Lockdown Browser for. If you have file upload where you want them to upload an Excel file, um, then yes, you could use that inside Canvas because you created a file upload because all that is is uploading the file directly into the Canvas question. That's allowable. 
But if it's take a screenshot of a drawing or an art class, those kinds of things, that's a very different thing. I would do that as a part two of the test question. Thank it's, you. That's so helpful. Like, like to add running to that, out of your problem. Uh, to add to that, Susie, um, I did test with um, a different instructor. I was curious to see how it would work if you have um, uh, a test question where you want students to actually look at a document you provide so like you want to link a word document inside you know the wisdom editor for a test question that does work because it's inside the test environment and so students can you know even though you haven't made a special exception for word or anything like that as long as it's linked inside the test question the students can click on it open it and read it and then you know um answer the question accordingly so, so that will work um in the case you're talking about i would think you know based on what april said if they know in advance that they're going to have to have these pictures to submit, then have them do it and already have it on the computer. And then that way, like April said, you could have the file upload question and then they would just browse for the file. So you wouldn't necessarily have to capture the whole, you know, taking the picture and then figuring out, you know, how to access that and you know, all that. So it just kind of depends on how immediate they want the students to, to do that, but that's an option too. Thank you. That, that gives me a lot to think about. Um, so if it's a file that the instructor provides that needs to be linked within the test question, then they can answer it. But if a student were to open a software program to create something, it probably wouldn't allow that, well, right? No, not necessarily. Like you can specify if there's a specific piece of software you want your students to actually have access to, you can actually specify that in Respondus. But um, you, you need to be careful with what your specificity is because um, you don't want to open up the portal for students to be able to go somewhere to web browse, basically. So you, you might be very thoughtful about what kinds of software you're, you're using with your student. So again, um, think about what kind of test you're designing. And if it's a multiple choice, true, false, short answer, essay, fill in the blank, those kinds of questions, that's easily done in Respondus. Even a file upload, easily done with Respondus. But you're not talking about a file upload when you're talking about taking a picture with a camera. Um, and you're not talking, talking about, um, well, you are talking about file upload, but there are steps involved to create that file. So, and I think if you're going to do something strange, oh, look at the baby. I know. Can you guys so hear cute. me? We can, but hold on one second. Let me finish my thought and then I'll come back to you. Um, but when you, when you want to um, do something way out of the norm that's going to be flagged, it's going to give the instructor a big headache to have to look at all those flags. Oh, so cute. Um, so my, 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 my point is I would do it outside of the Respondus browser and have your test be two parts. I think that would save the instructor a lot of headaches. Now that is freaking, I, no one can compete with that. Hey, Dorley. I, I figured it would help me to um, interrupt you. Um, I, I had an idea of why would they have to upload a document? Could they not just put it in their Google Drive and share a link to the document? During a, a timed exam, this computer science professor wanted students to create a to draw a diagram of how they would uh, troubleshoot a certain computer science problem. And so he wanted it to be immediate where they right. hadn't seen the question in advance. And he didn't want them to be forced to do a software to draw, to draw mm -hmm. digitally. He wanted them to draw it on pen and paper if they wanted to. They could use a software program if they wanted to, or they could draw on pen and paper. So those were the parameters I was working with them and trying to give them guidance. Okay. Again, yeah, I, I think, think it would that, work. I think I it could work. It would just be flagged at that time. And so he's going to have a flag for every student whenever they go to that step. But as long as he's willing to look at the flags, it's no big deal. And this so is much. the reason why I didn't say I could help co-host this event. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> so um, I have to head out to another webinar. I have to open it up. So do y'all want me to leave this running? Um, I made sure Anita and April were the hosts. Or, or are we ready to end it? Uh, we're at 1054 right now. I think if there's no more questions, we're ready to end, but it's up to okay, you. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. This has been um, uh, very helpful for me. Um, again,
I'm not an expert on this at all. Um, if you, uh, I've announced this throughout. Again, Carla is here. She is the ITC for the School of Ed. Michelle is here. She's an ITC for HHS. Uh, April is ITC for Brian. Anita is ITC for uh, College of Arts and Science. Uh, so if you don't know who your ITC is, please let us know. Um, and Susie works for UNCG Online. Susie works for UNCG Online. Um, and uh, so uh, thank you for coming. Uh, sorry that I have to wrap this up. Uh, it's been great. It's been recorded and you will all get the recording. And yeah, Carly, your baby is very cute. Yeah. Okay. See y'all. Bye. Bye.